The first person Darren Fletcher ever interviewed was Brian Clough. He went on to commentate with him as well in his spell covering Forest for Radio Trend and Century. He'll also tell you about how he thinks Forest could get promoted this season. Darren Fletcher, next. Well, Fletch, fantastic to see you again. Um, probably 25 years after, I would imagine, we, we first met covering David Platt's Nottingham Forest for me. I know you were there before that. Uh, when did you start, actually? That's perhaps my first question. Yeah, um, 1990, all, uh, September 1990. So it was just after the World Cup. Um, and it, it was it was the season of the FA Cup final. So they... they reached the FA Cup final at the end of my first year, but I wasn't commentating then. I was only reporting. I was actually on the pitch at Wembley. I was the pitch side reporter at Wembley, which was which was wow. great. Because yeah. obviously Gascoigne was off the scale all day. So I remember I remember being down there. I mean, it was like Cluffy had got to an FA Cup final, so it was mad. So the fact that I was nine months removed from a building site and was now stood in the middle of the pitch at Wembley with a microphone asking people like Gary Lineker to talk to me was pretty much off the scale. But I remember Gascoigne coming out and he'd got a baggy pair of shell suit bottoms on and then like dress shoes. They were like leather shoes. <laughs> and it was like, it was crackers because obviously Gascoigne had starred in the World Cup. So he was the biggest show in town. So to actually be near him was mad. But he came out in these like dress shoes and baggy tracky bottoms and was squirting drinks at everybody and was off the scale from that point on. I mean, it wasn't as if th that switch went during the match. He was, he was, he was unhinged from getting off the coach because right. he was on, right. the, on the, the pre-match walk around where they've got the suits on. Tottenham didn't do the suits, they did tracksuit. So even at that stage, he was, he was causing all kinds of commotion out there. So it wasn't that much of a surprise, but that, that was my first season. And then it, it kind of went from there. And how do you look back on that? that start and that kind of finding your way as well in, in, in broadcasting, in local broadcasting, mainly about one club as well. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's weird. And when you look back on it now, it's even more bizarre because I, it would be the equivalent now of, I would say, your first job would be covering Jurgen Klopp or Pep Guardiola on a daily basis. Because obviously my first job was, was, was Brian Clough. So it was, and I'd gone from living in the city and watching the games and buying tickets and standing on the Trent end. And, you know, my early memories of, of being a football fan was, I was born in 71. So you're thinking like 78 league championship, I'd be six and a half and you remember it. And then you start to go during the European times. And when you're a kid at that impressionable age, your team's the best team in Europe. Yeah, so wow. you just think that happens all the time. You just automatically assume that that's who Forest are. Um, and then that kind of carries on. You get a bit of a barren spell, but they're in the first division. And then they get the young team, Nigel, Chettel, Piercy, come Des, and they start to get to Wembley again. And then you're in there working. So I'd gone from, you know, kind of following them through the, the League Cup wins in... 89 and 90 as a fan so by the summer of 1990 I'm now I'm now covering the club and speaking to Brian Clough I mean it was a ridiculous change. How were you about because that I'm, because you know from from you know if we did that now I mean I, I would still I don't speak for myself I would still be like really nervous if he was still around of interviewing Clough now but go back then to when yeah. you're what not even 20, you're around 20 years old. I was 18, I, I was 18, 18, just 18. I turned 18, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and the first interview I ever did was with him. Wow. So I, I, I started, I did a bit of work for a guy called Tony Dallahunty who was the sports editor and he got a PR company. So I got in, I was putting up suspended ceilings in Sheffield and I had no thought about I'd never done any journalism or nothing I was just a kid who was wasting his time at school and ended up on a building site but had a, a, an unhealthy obsession with football and sport and I've got this crazy memory where I can't remember anything other than sporting information and facts I can't remember anything else 
but I, I've got this memory of retention. If, I, if I've ever watched a match, I can remember it like in detail. It's mad. It really handy for your I, job. I, yeah, but, but, but it was useless when I was put up to spend the ceiling. I was quite <laughs> good in the quizzes and I was a cup of tea, but that was about it. But, so he got a PR company and, and my dad was an accountant of a guy who owned a gym in the city. And Tony trained there. And Tony said, I've got a problem. I've got this event and I need a runner. So this guy said, well, my accountant's lad, sport obsessed. He'd love it. He'd do it. So it was three weeks and it was a running race from Glasgow to London called the Sun Life Great Race. They only did it once. That's how it started. Then within a week, he said, oh, I need you to go to the forest and do an interview. And they were playing Man United on the Saturday. So I said to him, well, who with? And he said, well, that's, that's for you to work out. You know, you go down and do it. So I said, okay. So I, mean, so I, get, I get the Ewer. I was the Ewer back then. It wasn't a digital thing. It was to take real to real. Wrote some questions out and went down and walked in the front door that you know really well, through the glass doors at the front, into the little office that used to be on the left, which is not there now, and said to a lady who it transpired was Carol, Brian's secretary, I've, I'm from Radio Trent and I've come to do an interview. And she said, well, who with? I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm just off a yeah. building, so I have no idea. I don't know how this works. <laughs> so I just said, Brian Clough. So she said, okay, I'll go and ask him. So off she went. And I sat in the corridor outside. She came back and said, yeah, he'll speak to you. So wow. I ended up waiting about three hours and we did it. And he got Alan Hill and Archie Gemmel in the room as well. So I was nervous, I was sweating, I was shaking. Because when I was a kid, my granddad, because um, I grew up essentially with, with my granddad, my granddad was a massive Forest fan, and he, he almost used to use Brian Clough as a deterrent. So he'd say, if you do that again, when I was a kid, I'll tell Mr Clough. So right. I got Brian Clough, this, like, this like, disciplinarian in me. Which house. is eminently like, believable. Right, yeah, yeah. So, so he was like this figurehead all the way through my childhood, you know. So... He's in there and I'm sweating. And I've got questions written down on a piece of paper. And he just leant forward and took the paper and scrunched it up and dropped it on the floor Brilliant. and went, off you go. Yeah. So I did this really bad interview with, with Cluffy about Man U. Um, and he was great, so it was all right. But I was terrible, but he was great. But that was the first, that was the first interview I ever did. I've never done an interview with anybody else in my life. And I remember thinking when I got in the car, it can never be this bad again. <laughs> no matter what happens in the future, whoever it is, I'll never, ever feel like this again. Both frightened to death and exhilarated in equal measure. It must have been the, the journalistic equivalent of a parachute jump. You know, it was like bonkers. Of all the people um, in the UK at that time to interview, yeah. he would have been, you know, know, not just football, but he would have been, I mean, Maggie Thatcher, I suppose, might have been equally terrifying. Yeah. I don't know, but... You know, yeah. it would have been up there. Yeah. But what I didn't know until later, which I experienced myself, whenever anybody knew went to the ground, he'd, he'd do, he'd, he would speak to them. Oh, and right. It was almost like the initiation. So if you went and you, you asked for him and you'd not been before, he'd say yes. So I didn't know that. And I, but I only, I only got to know that by seeing it happen. Yeah. And by I being, there. being one of the people that would say to anybody new, well, go and ask because you'll get fluffy today. Because that was what he did. So it was like this, you, you, you would lock this little secret when you went down and you knew. I remember one line he gave me. Nigel Jensen had scored the winner in the League Cup final against Oldham the previous spring. So he, he, was, he was kind of, you know, a, 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 high, a rising profile striker. So I remember asking about him. I said, you know, what about Nigel Jensen? And he, he, first of all, he told me that Mark Robbins' dad was a policeman. So he, he, he liked Mark Robbins because his dad was a policeman. And he made a big thing about the fact that Mark Robbins' dad was a policeman. So he liked that. And, but then I asked him about Jemson. And I said, what about, you know, I, I can't remember what the question was. It, was a bad, it would have been a bad question because they all were. But he, he, then, he then said, he said, he said, when you ask me about young Jemson, he said, if he keeps his feet on the ground, he'll go far. He said, if he doesn't keep his feet on the ground, he'll definitely go far. <laughs> <laughs> what a line that is. Yeah. But, he, but he, was, he, he, was, he was great. And, and, and frightened me to death, made me sweat more than I was sweating in my life. Didn't realise I could shake that much. But it, it was, yeah. It's a great it was, initiation. It was, uh, 
Yeah. Because if memory yeah. serves, when I, I would guess, I'm trying to work out timelines, but about 20 years later, you'd have done comedy. I mean, you certainly had him in the studio, didn't you, at, at Century for yeah. phone ins? And I, yeah. did he do commentary with you as well? On, we on we some did co commentary with him. So we, yeah. we did three co commentaries. We did Derby Man United at Pride Park that finished 3 3. I remember Luciano Zavagno getting the equaliser. Where is he today? But we had Cluffy with us that day. And he took us to the boardroom after the game to confront Jeff Hoon, the Labour MP, about something that had happened years ago. <laughs> so we, we went off to the boardroom with all the kit, walked in. Um, I'm a Jeff Hoon. We were there about two minutes, then we left. Um, we did Forest Derby at the city ground. And he said to me during commentary, I said to him, well, Brian, I said, I could just stop commentating and listen to you. And he said, son, I think the audience would appreciate that because I make a lot more sense than you do. <laughs> but I remember sitting there, he'd been retired a while, and Paul Hart was manager. And he said after about two minutes, if he doesn't do this, this, and this, they're going to lose. He'd seen it straight off. Right. I'm not being disrespectful to Paul, but he changed it after about 75 minutes. And when he changed it, the game changed. And he'd right. spotted wow. it. He'd spotted it inside five minutes. And he said, if he doesn't do this, and then we did England against Serbia and Montenegro at the Walkers Stadium, as it was then, not the King Power as it is now. And it was the night where Sven was the manager and they had about six captains. They were throwing the armband around. And I've never seen him so angry. Right. Because he'd only got three caps, I think it was, and he'd found it so hard to get in the England team. And then he'd been ignored to be the manager. But he cared passionately about the England and the badge. And he didn't like the fact that Ericsson was the manager. And he disliked it even more. There was one point where I think Phil Neville was one of the players. It was either thrown to him or he threw it. And the armband was just on the floor. The, gate, the guy had not even picked it up yet. And he said then, he said, that is the England captain's armband. It's on the floor. He said, this is where we've got. And he was furious, furious. Yeah. And I was just grateful that we didn't bump into any players or Ericsson after, because he would have said something. He was he was living. Yeah. But we yeah. did we did that. Yeah, we did three of those, and we did the phone in once a month. And it was mad, you know, because I said to Gary, "Why don't you ask Nigel?" Because we've not heard from him. He'd been he'd been ill, um, but he'd got himself well. And I said, "Why don't you see if we can talk to him?" And that was the idea. We just talked to him, you know, and. When Gary Rook, Nigel said, you're the only people that's called. We're the only people. Can you imagine that? Only oh, us. Really? And he said, my dad would love to. He said, he thinks everybody's forgotten him. So Jeez. we spoke to, yeah. We, and he did it. He did it. Nothing to do with me. He did it because of the respect and love he got for Gary Berkles. He absolutely adored Gaz. Adored him. Um, they were close. And he did it for him. But he did it because nobody else had asked him. And I remember sitting there thinking, oh, crazy. I mean, Ferguson now must be inundated with requests that he says no to because he'd be speaking to yeah. every man and his dog every day. But no one had bothered to ask him. That's really I annoyed thought, me because it, yeah. it's made me annoyed because I'm thinking, well, why didn't I just pick up the phone? No. If it was that straightforward, but, you know. Well, but I don't think it was. I think Gaz, I think we felt that because of what he thought about Gaz, he got a chance of saying yes. Mm, okay, yeah. And, and I just said to Gaz, Ask him. And he did it and he loved it and he was brilliant. He was a pleasure. And he came in, never let us down. He came in on time. He, he, he came in every day. He was supposed to come in. It was never a problem. You could set your watch by him. Once he said he was coming, he was there and he was great value and everybody loved him. And to listen to people's voices when they got through to ask their question to him, it was their, it was their football in Christmas. So it was yeah, so, it's magic. so special to hear them being able to interact with him which they never would have done before. That was, that was the bit that made it, you know, so special. And anything he said was, was gold, wasn't it? I mean, you know, yeah. some of it was a bit near the knuckle. I think if we were broadcasting it now, you could have one or two issues, but it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a fabulous time. Fabulous yeah, it was time. Gold we, I mean, he's just gold yeah. dust, isn't he? So yeah. showbiz we and everything. We the football awards as well. And we presented a merit award. And the first time we, we gave it to, to Brian. So we did it at Pride Park. There's a lounge there. It was a black tie thing. It was a, a big thing. And um, 
he we got Jeff Hurst as the speaker. So Jeff was the speaker. So we get Brian on the stage. Barbara came and Nigel came and he got a lot of family and friends on his table. Um, Jim Smith was there. All, all the clubs were represented, but it was Brian's night. He was he was the recipient. So he stood up and we just thought he'd take the award. And Gary and I were um, hosting it. And Sir Jeff was coming on after Brian. This was the last bit of the night. So he stands up and Mickey Thomas was there. But Mickey Thomas had come in a sweatshirt. So everyone's in a black tie, apart from Mickey Thomas who's got a sweatshirt on. So he stands up, Cluffy, and he said, uh, he said, first and foremost, he said, I know we're raising money for a great cause tonight. He said, but would anybody mind if I take a little bit out to buy Mickey Thomas a shirt and tie? <laughs> so that got everybody going straight away. He then stood up and did 20 minutes impromptu speech that was hilarious and he was picking people out in the room sharp as a razor and he then said to me and he said I've, I've, he said i've got to sit down now he's remembering clearly so i'm going to sit down now he said because i've got a lovely table he said but barbara my wife is at the cringing stage i can tell by her face i've gone too far <laughs> he said but what i would just say before i sit down he said i know i've not been very well he said, but to stand me up here with two bloody undertakers, it's taking it a bit too far. But it gas I decided at the back. <laughs> then Jeff Hurst said, I'm not going on now. He said, I can't follow that. And we literally had to coax Sir Jeff onto the wow. stage. We paid, we paid him and everything. But he just said, How do you follow that? And I yeah. felt for him because how do you follow that? I mean, it, yeah. was, it was just off the cuff and it was typical cluffy and it was sharp, it was hilarious. Everything was timed to perfection. And then poor old Sir Jeff, who won the World Cup for us in 66, and got to follow it. And he yes. said, this is, and he's going to come off and said, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's a great audience. He said, but none of my stories were as good as any one of his, you know. He <laughs> felt a bit B-list. I was yeah. going, on a similar vein, I was going to ask you about your the time after Clough, you know, in, in the kind of, I mean, Frank Clark had a terrific spell, but covering Forest yeah. in that spell right through to, I mean, I'm trying to think with Century, when you left, Paul Hart would have been the last manager, I think, from memory. So what was that kind of yeah, I mean, big, I big spell? Yeah, I was Paul. I mean, the, the spell under Frank was fantastic. Yeah. And I still see Frank every day now. Frank lives in the same village as me. And Frank goes to the same gym as me. Right. And I see Frank every day. If I go for a meal in the local pub, Frank's in there with his wife. <laughs> if I go to the ground at Forest, Frank's in there. So I see Frank all the time. And we're only laughing last week about the European trips because Frank never knew about any of the things that we were getting up to because he was there with the team. So he was telling me things from the team perspective and I was telling him all the fun stuff that we were doing while we were there. <laughs> so we had a really good catch up about that. But I mean, they were great times. And I remember thinking, because they obviously Brian had retired and it was a real low and Keen left and Nigel left that summer. But then they got Collymore and they got Cooper. And then gradually as the season wore on, they got Phillips and Bohean and, and people like that. And this thing started to roll. I don't think any of us as Forest people give enough credit, time, respect, whatever it is, to Frank's season when he got them into the Premier League and they finished third. And they went through a spell, I think November, December, where they didn't win. And I think if you look at the league table that year, if they'd have won two or three during that point, they'd have won the league that year. They were that mm. good. And Stan was that good. And the whole group was that good. And, you know, they were, they were beating Man United at Old Trafford and nobody was doing that. They were, they, were, they were winning games against good teams. And I remember thinking, they're onto something here. And it, and it, all, it all just went in that year. And I always feel they sacked him too quickly. But they should have given him a bit more time. He'd been so good. The thing with Frank is, never thought Frank was one of those managers that would make kind of crazy knee-jerk decisions. He's a very solid man. Everything he does, he thinks through. And I think he would have found a way to get out the other side. But they didn't. They panicked and they got rid of him. And I think people always say, well, they've never managed to get any stability since Brian left. They've never had any stability since Frank left either. Mm. And I think that was the opportunity to put someone in place for five or six years, even that period of time, that would have helped the club reset and be ready. But I think they've always been chasing it from that point onward, really. Um, but yeah, you know, Frank was in and then we had Stuart for a while. 
Um, and Nigel came back, which was which was great for everybody. And then we went through we went through a succession. I, I couldn't even begin to tell you the old word. Joe Kinnear popped up at some point. And, oh, you were there for that, were you? Yeah, so you were. Yeah, so of that was after Hearty and and then yeah, Gary Mixon after that. I remember speaking to Joe the day before the season tickets came out. And he told me that he got an A-list and a B-list of players to buy. And on his A-list was Dennis Bergkamp. And at that point, I remember thinking, yeah, nah. Because there's no way Forrest was signing Dennis Bergkamp from Arsenal. And it was no. all designed at that point to get people to buy season tickets. And it was just... I, I did have phases where I fell out of love with it. I didn't yeah. like... Because you were too like close to it. it. Yeah. And I could you knew see, what was going on, yeah. Yeah, I did. And, and what I could never do, I mean, we did the phone in it every night, Larry and I, and then Gary and I. I could never lie to the supporters. So I knew that they were being spun a yarn. And I couldn't sit back and go, let's just go along with it. It was nonsense. It was unfair mm. because I think they've got one of the best fan bases in the country. You know, when you look at it now, they're a championship side. And the only reason they're getting 27,500 is the ground that old 38,500 yeah. because they fill it to that point easily. Um, and, I, and they've been so loyal through so many downs and the odd up that I'm, I'm thrilled to bits that they're enjoying it as much as they are now. But some of the things that were going on, I mean, Mark Arthur's period there, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go with that. And I was getting told stuff all the time about the way transfers were being done and what was being promised to players and then that would get changed when they get to the ground. There, there was a lot of that. And I know David Platt's not popular with the supporters, but he got he got the goalpost move so often. It was unbelievable. But he was he was solid enough as a fella not to come out and tell everybody. And then the same thing happened to Paul. Paul was sacked too soon. And then they lost him from the academy side, which was a massive loss. All these things were going on. Um, and it, it, it just kind of left a bit of a bad taste because it had been so good with so many people for so long. And then yeah. it changed. And, you know, I also think they missed the trick too under, under Dave Bassett when they won the league with that team that included Stone and, and Van Hooydonk and Campbell. And I remember speaking to Stoney that summer and he said, we're two players away from being top half in the Premier League next year. Never mind about staying up. He said, because we've got internationals in the side and everybody's on the same page. We're playing good football. We, we score goals. We don't let many in. And then Irving Scholar sells Kevin Campbell behind the manager's back and everything goes wrong again. So they've been great at shooting themselves in the foot at really important times. But this, the current group they've got in there now, the ownership, the chairman, the people that are in key positions there now, it feels more like it used to feel. They're good, solid people. They care about what they're doing. They're, they're kind of aligned with the supporters. There's a lot more transparency. And I think it's the... You know, people can believe what they're being told because they're good people who want to do well for the club. So it does feel very different again now. And I think that can only be a good thing. There is more to come from Darren Fletcher on the way very soon. If you've got a thought about who you might want me to interview over the coming weeks and months, leave a comment below and I'll do my best to get hold of that person and maybe get them on the channel in future weeks. No promises, uh, but we will see what we can do. There is a long list already, but I can always add a name or two to it. I need to thank my members of Chippers Club, particularly the gold members. If you're interested in signing up uh, to get these videos without adverts, a longer view, uh, and to get them early as well, the link is in the description below for you to sign up to Chippers Club or if you want them as podcast as well, that link is below too. But my gold members this week are Henny the Hero, Tiny Media, Philip Sheldon, Chris Annabel, Paul Harrison, Christian Tonnies, Perry, James Sorden, Thomas Newton, Mark German, Alan Francis, David Shelton, Mark Davis, Ez Chowdhury, Paul Metcalf, Tim Hayward, Richard Waterhouse, and Ian Russell. As I say, if you want to join the list and get a mention in the next video, then the link is in the description below. Let's get back though to Darren Fletcher. Radio commentary is very different to, to TV commentary. When did you think, or maybe you, maybe you never did and you, got, you just got approached, but when did you think, oh, I could do TV commentary? And how did you go about adapting? I'm exactly, it's exactly what you said. I never thought about it. My, my, right. my thought was I'd gone to Five Live. I knew that Alan and Mike would be finishing soon or at some stage within 
a good time frame for me. Um, and I think the, the, the thought process was that I would step in with John Murray and do what they were doing. And that was in my mind. And it, I'd never thought about anything else. And then I'd done a couple of match of the day things, but that's not really TV commentary because you, you're doing highlights. Yeah. So you put the mic down a lot of the time when you're there doing match of the day and you pick it up when there's something happening. So it's not, it's very similar to radio commentary. It, you, you don't really do a full game. So it's different. And then they go away and edit it anyway. So it, it's, 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 not, it's not preparation in any way, shape or form. When I got the chance to go to, to BT, I think they'd originally approached John Murray to do it. And John didn't want to do it because he wants to be the football correspondent at Five Live, which has always been his ambition. So John was a non-starter. They asked me if I'd go and speak to them, which I did. And I got on well with them. And I accepted it. But I said to him at the time, I haven't done television commentary. And I think for the first three years, it was pretty clear that I've not done TV commentary because <laughs> I spoke in what, in what way? I mean, I, I would disagree, but in what way would, in what well, way? I, I, I used to, I used to, I used to, I'll be honest with you, I used to, now I go to work now and I get in the car and I get to the ground and I'm excited. I used to get to the ground for three years trying to survive the day and not right. mess it up to the point where they wouldn't ask me back next week. I was that, that lacking confidence because I, I knew deep down, I didn't know fundamentally how to do it because I'd done radio commentary for, crikey. Uh, 20 years. 20 years. And yeah. I'd never done television. So it was the equivalent of telling somebody, right, you've walked on your feet. Now you've got to walk on your hands. And expect the next day that you walk down the street on your hands. It's just, it's just totally different. It, yeah. it, there's there's very little in common with it, which people so won't really, believe, will they? Because it's commentating on a game, but it is yeah. it is very very. I mean, totally if you different. leave a port to give an example, if you left a pause for ten seconds, fifteen seconds on a TV game, nobody would say anything. But on no. the radio, and and actually, you know, many people would enjoy that that pause. But on the radio, if you leave a pause, you're in big trouble. You are, yeah, and and. I was lucky. I've always been lucky that I've had people who have been prepared to, to help me, to, to give me their wisdom and to give me time to develop. So when I went to Five Live, it was Tony Delahunty originally. It was Jonathan Wall when I went to Five Live. It was Grant Best when I went to BT and subsequently Simon Green. I've always managed to find someone that's gone, we'll help you. So it took me probably three years, probably the whole of my first contract with them to work out what I thought I needed to do. And only at that stage did I, after that, did I start to enjoy it. And I felt like I'd got a bit of a rhythm and I so felt what like I... What did you change? Or did you, was it just like what? being there for three years, the mere presence it, of being it, there? Yeah, it was being there for three years, but I watched everything. And I do now. I, I'll get home from a game and I'll watch it in its entirety because that's that's the only way I can get better so I used to sit there thinking well if you're watching it and you don't like it what about everybody else so until I actually looked at it and thought well this is getting better then I thought well the audience might be thinking that too so that gave me a bit more confidence um also when you've done radio for that long if you make any mistake on there it doesn't matter nobody can see it so you can mm. dig yourself out the hole but you feel a lot more pressure on the TV because you, everybody can see what you can see. So you say one word wrong on a TV commentary and you're getting blasted. You do it on the radio and people don't really mind because they don't really know. No. So you've got a bit more of a safety net. So that brings other pressure with it. But what I did do after I've been there a bit longer, I reached out to Clive Tilsley and I said, look, Clive, I said, I'm, I'm starting to make a bit of progress here, but would you... Would you help me? Would, could I, you know, would you give me some advice and have a look at So he was great, very giving with his time. Again, someone that was prepared to help. And, and we went through a few things and he watched some games and he gave me some advice and then he watched that and then he'd say, we'll try this. And having him give me his knowledge gave me some information that I didn't have. So I, I could use that and work that in. And then I felt more confident. But I think you just naturally get more confident. When, when BT then say, well, we'd like you to do the Champions League final, that gives you confidence. Then you start to think, well, we must be doing something right, because otherwise they'd ask somebody else. So that helps too. But I don't think I'll ever 
feel that I, I've got it because I did radio for that long. But I, I, what I would say now is if I did a radio commentary now, I don't think I'd be able to do it. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, because I think I'd leave gaps. Yeah, okay. And I watch, I watch it back now, and I actually think that I talk less than quite a few TV commentators. Well, I never thought I'd say that, but I think I leave bigger gaps in the game than some now. And I never thought I'd get to that point. But I think if I did a, a radio commentary now, I'd be, I'd be, I'd find it difficult. Because there are kind of two ways of doing it, aren't there? I mean, you tell me, I've, I've only done a handful of TV commentary since I've been out here, but there seem to be kind of the old school, if you like, if that's not too dismissive of, you know, leaving gaps and the kind of the Barry Davis kind of interesting, very interesting, where you, you do tell people who the players are, but that's about yeah. it. And you're, you know, you're a wordsmith. But then there's the other way, perhaps more modern way, of lots of stats um, and lots of explanation. Do you? Yeah. Uh, is there a point in your career where you decide which one you are? I'm not bright enough to be a wordsmith, so that I, there's no. I I, right. I haven't got the vocabulary of Barry Davis, Peter Drury. I haven't got it. Clive, I haven't got it. It's not me. I, 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 whether I'm not bright enough, I don't know, but that's not me. I could sit there and use words that w it's not me. W I wouldn't be comfortable. I, I don't know what my style is. That just feels like the way I should do it. I've never really thought about it. I, it's quite a spontaneous thing for me when, when I do it. And I think if I thought about why I do it, I, I don't think I'd work it out. It, I just, it's just how it's developed over time. But that's perhaps but I, the best I, way, I get isn't it? I'm excited about the math. You I'm can only excited. be you. Yeah, but I'm excited by the game. So I, if I'm not into the game, I, I can't help that. That's natural. So if I get a bit carried away at certain times, that's because I'm really enjoying it. And yeah. I can't stop that. I can't keep a lid on that. So that's just, that's just who I am. And I can't change it. Um, and I don't think I'd do myself any favours if I tried to. It's, no. That's just how it is. What I do try and do, though, is get better all the time. And I do watch all the other commentators and try and see what they do really well and try and improve the way I do that, you know, and use, use them as, as my peers. And, and it's like going into the classroom, watching another match with another commentator. They, they'll describe a certain situation or, and I'll think that was really good. Now I'll try and try and nick a bit. And I'm sure everybody else does as well, because why wouldn't you? Yeah, you know, absolutely. There's some fantastic commentators out there. So why, why wouldn't you try and learn from them? And if you, let's say it's, um, there's no such thing as a run-of-the-mill Premier League game, but if there was a, you know, a, a regular Saturday lunch, is it Saturday lunchtime still, BT? Yeah. Right? Or Saturday evening? Saturday, yeah. Saturday lunchtime. Lunchtime, yeah. If, if there was a regular Saturday lunchtime game, how long would you prep for that? How long would that take you to, yeah. to get ready for well, that? Because, because I do the Premier League and the Champions League, we've got, Europa League, Europa Conference League, different things. I just do the two. So I suppose you, the answer would be all the time. Yeah, You're okay. Constantly following the, the competition and what the narrative is going in. In terms of putting a commentary sheet together, it's kind of built up over a period of time, but then it, you, know, you kind of spend a day doing it, but you've, you've spent more days reading all the articles and, and following what's happening and looking back at the goals and all that. But because we've got the slot, I mean, I did Leeds last week. So I did Leeds Tottenham last week. So I got Leeds this week. So Leeds is, is easy this week. It's it, yeah. Jesse Marsh is what I've got to look at this week, not Leeds, because I did Leeds last week. I did Leicester three weeks ago against Liverpool. So I've got recent experience of both of them. So in terms of that, the narrative itself is pretty self-explanatory, but we've got a new manager, so that's the key. So it's what elements there are. And I think as well, you made a great point that you can be, a, this is the player's name, and then a really nice piece of English around the goal, and that, that's enough. So you don't need 
masses. You need eventualities, don't you? So if this happens in the game, what's the significance of that? So in a way, you're trying to you're trying to predict what might happen, and you might never use it because if it doesn't happen, it's useless to you. But you're trying to yeah. look what the narrative is, you know. So if Leeds concede three again this week, as they have done for the previous five games, you know what, what's the relevance of that? And, why was Jesse Marsh not very good at Leipzig? Is there a reason behind it? You know, and what is he going to do? There are eventualities, really. So not, it'd be difficult to sit down and go, here's a specific time that I'd spend on that match because it just depends depends what it is. I mean, next week I'm doing Brighton Liverpool. Now, I've not done Brighton for quite some time, so that'll take it longer. But, of course, I do Liverpool a lot because I do them in the Champions League as well as the Premier League. So I see Liverpool, Manchester City, Probably as much as any as any team. Not um, a bad place to be. <laughs> no, but, but obviously then you don't see Brighton as much. No. So you've got so a when you, bit more work. And is, so is your biggest issue with Brighton player ID, or is it having the knowledge that you have intrinsically with Liverpool and Manchester City also to have about Brighton? I think it's that, and I think the thing is, it's it's the, the narrative might look what the, like like that's what the narrative is from the outside, but it might not be. You know, there can be subtle changes. So all things point to that being the narrative. But people who watch him all the time might say, yeah, but a couple of weeks ago that changed. You know, yeah. yeah, they have conceded a lot of goals, but that's changed now. They've been doing, so you've got to get to that, that point where you think, I feel you've got to walk in as though you've been watching them for a period of time. You can't just pick them up and say, well, I've not seen you for... 18 games and I'm going to work it out on the fly. You've got to get a bit more idea of what the truth is and what the true picture is. So that that's the challenge really, I suppose, because their fans are watching it thinking, well, I watch every game. Yeah. So you, you've got to, you've got to be respectful of that. I think. Just finally to wrap up, you've been very generous with your, your time. How much would it mean? I don't know if you'd be allowed to, perhaps you would. If, if Forrest do the unthinkable of a few months ago and get promoted this season and, and end up in the Premier League, yeah, how much would it mean to be on that rickety old gantry above the, um, the Peter Taylor stand and, and be calling a game in the in the Premier League? Yeah, I've, I've done it once. I've been up there oh. once. Um, I played Arsenal in the FA Cup. Gary Brazil was the manager. Ben Brereton Diaz was just playing old Ben Brereton back then. Yes. Eric Lehigh, I think, got himself a dog out of his performance. <laughs> and I was up there with Robbie Savage. And it was mad. And the image I got in my mind was, I think if you go onto YouTube and find the game, they played a European Cup match, 1978, against Liverpool, first one, en route to the first final. And the shot is the European Cup on that gantry. Right. So you can see the city ground over there and the, the, the FA Cup is on a table on the gantry, looking down. So I remember being up there thinking, this is where the European Cup was. That, that was the image I got in my mind. Um, but I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. And, and I, what I'd also love to do before I finish, I need Colin Frey to take a weekend off because I'd like to do one more game on the radio from the city ground. I'd like to do one more Forest game on the radio and broadcast to the people of Nottingham and not anybody else. Because that's, that's where, where I started. And I, I would love to do that again. Just one. I've got a season. Just one game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd like to just do a game. From Drop him an email. He has, he has the odd yeah. week off normally in October. I'll leave I that. Yeah, exactly. I'm sure he can do the break. <laughs> but I'd love to do that. I'd love to go, you know, because that's, that's what I did. And I yeah. had such a great time doing it. But I'd love to do it. I'd love to do it again. But I think they will be back. I think they will be back. And if it's not this year, I think it'll be next year. And I think I've not felt that confident about them for quite some time. But I know, I know the decisions that are being taken. I speak to people in there. I've got good relationships with the people that are running the club now. And believe me, they're in good hands. They... They're making good decisions. The chief exec has been a good appointment. His appointment of Steve Cooper has been inspired. And, and they will try and bring players to the club now that the supporters can connect with and, and that they're going to be players that can help the club grow. So I, I've not got any doubt that they will get there. 
Whether it's this season, I don't know, because they started from so far back. That's the yeah. problem. Had they gone from a, a standing start, I think they'd be all right. But they're not. But I certainly think that they'll recruit well in the summer and he'll, Steve will be able to attract the kind of players that, that, they, that they maybe couldn't get before because um, he's, he's great at improving young players. A lot of people, it's interesting because when, when the job was available, of course, you, you get loads of people linked with jobs. And obviously, Joe Cole works with us at BT. Stephen Gerrard worked with us at BT. Doesn't now, but I stayed in touch with him. Frank Lampard was with us at BT. Obviously, he's now at Everton. But each of those three, straight away when he got the job, said, you've got a good one there. And they know him. Right. You've got a good one there. You've got a good one there. And straight away, Stephen was happy for Keenan Davis to come in, in January because he knows that Stephen helped him become a better player. So there's a generation of people who have been around him, who know him, know he's a good guy. And big clubs in the Premier League will look at him and go, well, of course I'll send my young central midfield player there for a season because he's going to play and he's going to come back a better player. Yes, Garner is the perfect example. Jed Spence is another one. You know, they're going to go on and have careers. It might not be at Forest, but they're going to look back and say, that fella did wonders for me. And, it, and it, everybody it benefits, be, don't they? Right, everybody benefits. And I think when you're in that situation, if you're not going to parachute play, which they haven't, you've got to do it another way. And that's the way they're going to do it. They're going to go and attract the best young players that need a bit of polishing. They're going to go into the city ground. They're going to have big seasons and it's going to make that club competitive season on season. And then when they do get promoted, there's enough money behind the scenes. Once, see, at the moment, they've got a problem. Financial fair play holds them back. Yeah. They can't just bankroll their way out. No. When they get in the Premier League, it's different. So then they yeah. can start to spend a little bit more. And, and then they, they, I, I think the club will be easier for them to sustain in the Premier League than it is in the Championship, in all honesty. Um, so I, I, think, I think they're exciting times. And I, and I think they're heading back in the right direction. And in my lifetime, I don't think there's ever been the excitement around the team that's being generated now in terms of attendance. Yeah, there's been the excitement because they've been in cup finals and all that. And they've had some big name players in the city that create a buzz. But I spoke to John McGovern a couple of weeks ago about it. And he said, Fletch, remember winning the championship? We didn't get this man. No. You know, no. And, and when Ben you Osborne made a really good... Respect... Sorry, Fletch. Ben Osborne made a really good point on... He was on a couple of weeks ago on, on here and said he was, in a way, upset to leave because he feels that any team that does get promoted back to the Premier League at Nottingham Forest will be remembered for an awful long yeah. time and, and the city will go mad for weeks. Yeah. But th th this is it now. I mean, I mean, you know, Frank had him in Europe and I remember some great nights. The night they played Balbo at home and Brian Roy scored a brilliant goal. Kevin Campbell was on commentary with us going mad. That the place was, 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 was electric. You could feel it. You could feel it. But you can feel it. You felt it against Arsenal this year. You felt it against Leicester. And they get way more in. If the ground was bigger, they'd get more yeah. in. It's just, it, I don't know. Whether it's, whether it's relief, whether it's a new generation, I don't know what it is. But the connection between the club and the fans at the minute is as strong as I can remember it. And I always used to think that uh, they were better off. They always felt better off either in a relegation fight or in the top six, because then you got that, they'd come and support them. I've never felt the city have been that great when they've been a mid-table team. We don't do mid-table. Yeah. We've either well, got a siege mentality or we're chasing something. And then it was great. But mid-table was yeah but everything now is turning people on everything now is i've got to be there what i hope now is that the businesses get to benefit getting to the premier league the businesses benefit the city benefits the yeah. city comes alive again you know and, and all of a sudden you've got a premier league club attached to the city and everything changes the whole dynamic changes and it's been too long and and we're desperate for it but I can I remember midweeks of like 13,000, 14,000 there, and you think, yeah, it's so far yeah, away from that now. I know, I know. And, and what I just hope, though, is that if it doesn't work this year, 
I just hope that people don't lose the faith because you people have got to remember that it was about staying up when he yeah. arrived. When yes. Steve walked in, it was let's get away. We can't get really got to finish above Derby. Now it's cool, blimey. If this would have started six weeks earlier, we might well have got automatic promotion. But if it, if they do fall short this year because Bournemouth signed four players on deadline from the Premier League, you can't do a great deal about that. No. So I just hope that this this excitement and this fervor continues into next season because they'll need it, and then it, that then that could be the year of all years for everybody. But I did say to somebody earlier, I think that if they do get into that playoff tournament, the experience they've gained from Leicester and Arsenal at home in the FA mm. Cup with this group will be invaluable because they'll yeah. have been in a one-off electrified situation and come through it. And I think that that could be a difference maker for them, that they'll walk out for their home leg in the playoffs or at Wembley for the final touch wood and they'll think, been here, done that, I can handle it. And there'll be maybe somebody coming out the other tunnel thinking, oh, didn't think it'd be like this, yeah. shivers up my spine. So I, I think that that if they get that far, the experience of these games that they've been involved in will be invaluable to them. Fletcher, it's been great fun. And what a great note to, to end on as well. Uh, really optimistic for the future. I just hope you're right. I hope you're right. Yeah, I think, so you're, right. I'm I saying, think you are. I'm telling everybody, so I have been right. Otherwise, <laughs> right for in 10 years' time, when they're in League One, we'll play this again. Yeah. <laughs> in 10 years' time, when we're reminiscing about Yeovil again. We'll, we'll, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Fletcher. All the best, mate. Thanks, mate.